Good evening one more time. Why don't we give the Lord a hand God to pray you on the time? Come on. So good to be back in the house of the Lord one more time. Amen. 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 I am Reverend Michael Glover, Associate Minister here at Great Emmanuel Baptist Church. I'm here to do our call to worship. Amen. Are we ready to praise the Lord? Amen. Are we ready to praise the Lord together? Amen. Amen. You know, we come this far by faith. Leaning on the Lord, amen. Trusting in His holy word, He's never failed us yet. I believe y'all believe that. He's never failed us, and He's not going to fail us.
part of it. It's part of it. It's part of it. It's going to be part of it. It's the right time today. It's the great celebration of today. Amen. At this time, we're going to have the entrance of the officers. Amen. Amen. The entrance of the officers.
sorry, to welcome everyone to our installation service for Reverend R. John Robinson. We've already had our congregational song. We will continue with our Old Testament scripture, our New Testament scripture, prayer invocation, musical selection, welcome, occasion, and another musical selection. Then we'll have our offering of love, and then the full people will be in charge. Y'all, as Reverend Glover uh, announced earlier, this is my old school church, right? It's a lot of us in here, but we're all here because we love Reverend Robinson. He has been a long time coming. This is a once in 50 years situation, so we are so blessed to have him as our new pastor. So, Robinson always be faithful and obedient to you. 
we pray that you will bless him, fill him with wisdom, good judgment, courage, zeal, patience, and your love that you might serve this congregation. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
y'all say amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a great hand of praise for the Lord. This pastor elect, may God bless you richly on this day. It's just good to be in the house of the Lord. And we can try to lift up this offering unto the Lord. I just believe that God is an awesome God. And that in the kingdom there's only abundance, there is no lack. For he says, I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly. Just because I got so much faith in God, I believe in praying before the giving. Somebody say amen. amen. So I'm going to ask you to bow with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, you have already given. Yes, sir. And thank you for the opportunity to give back a portion of what you have already provided. Yes, Father, we know that our gifts never come from our lack. It comes from our abundance. And so, Father, as we sow seeds into your kingdom, we ask that you are multiplying. We ask that you are restoring. And that be used to be a blessing in the kingdom of God. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. And everybody who believes the word of God, say together, Amen. Amen. You are not the hands of our ushers as we prepare for our offering. Amen. We want to acknowledge uh, Texas State. Pastor Thatcher couldn't be here, but $100 from the Texas State, $100 from our moderator, Pastor McGinty, and also $100 from the Gallery Creeks Memorial District Association. Amen. <laughs>
God has raised up Emmanuel Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. The Salem Institution was probably $100 next month. Amen. 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 All New Jerusalem is a blessing.
Father, we do thank you for these gifts. We bless that you the giver. Thank you for your abundance. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say together, Amen. Amen. To God be the Lord. Let's give the Lord a good big hand of praise for you. Now comes the time when we get ready to answer the question, is there a word from the Lord? Yes. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. The Bible says that he that has breath, praise the Lord, but it also says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church. So it's not if the Lord is speaking. The question is, are you listening to what God is about to say? Uh, we're going to call on my friend that I haven't seen in about five or six years. Amen. I have the privilege of pastoring his mother, none other than Reverend Michael Webb. Receive him with a great big amen as he introduces us. I'm going to rise of the sun to the going down of the same. The Lord's name is to be praised. Yes. First, we give all praise, Lord, and honor to God, because without him, we're but dust. To Pastor Lynn, her brothers, my cousin, my wife. I respect also to the Pastor Cal, my pastor, Pastor Trotter, Pastor Addison, my friend, and Pastor Stapleton, and the other pastors that may be here. Breathing in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I stand to introduce our speaker for this evening, in person of my pastor, Pastor Gregor C. Trotter, the Fisher Baptist Church in College. In the 22 years that I've been in ministry, I've learned a lot about people. And one thing I've learned that you can't be a good, a great pastor unless you're a great man. Now we have great men who are not pastors. If you're a great pastor, you have to be a great man. And I have to say, Pastor Trotter is a great man.
spirit to our honorees today. Yes. Amen. We bless the Lord. Yes. Yes. Amen. For you today. Yes. Yes. Amen. Still trying to figure out how of all these great preachers and pastors, one standing right here, Dr. Madison. Yes, sir. Yes. I can't figure out how you left Dallas and went all the way to the college <laughs> called on me instead of calling on Dr. Madison. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm humble and honored that you would consider me. Amen. Thank you, friendship, for coming in. Being here today in great numbers. Amen. Our ushers, our deacons, our ministers. Amen. And amen to all of the members, young and not so young. We all thought I was going to get in trouble. Amen. Young and old, I got to go back home. Amen. Young and not so young for being here. Amen. Today. Let me read our scripture and then I'll say a few more things and we'll get into. Amen. A scripture for today. Come from the book of Habakkuk. The Old Testament book. We have trouble spelling and time. <laughs> Not too far from the end of the Old Testament. Back in Lebanon, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. One with A to B, two A's, and Chapter number two, and I will read verses one through three. Amen. Do you have it? If you don't say, wait, preacher. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the town and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. The Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain upon the faith that he may run that read it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it yeah. shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. May the Lord bless the reader, the hearers, and the doers of his word. Father in heaven, we thank you now for this privilege and opportunity to share your word. We pray now to let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are our strength and redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. need to do a couple of other things and then we'll be ready to get into our sermon. I want my wife to stand. Amen. Amen. I do that so that these fellows sitting in here looking around. Not 
O oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And thy will not hear. Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thy will not say. In fact, most of the first chapter is devoted to his question. As chapter 2 begins, Habakkuk declares that he will wait to hear God's answer to his question. Then God begins to speak, telling the prophet to write his answer in a letter so that all will see and understand. It may seem, God says, as though the wicked triumph, but eventually, guess what? They will be judged. And righteousness will prevail. A few years ago, when the Supreme Court made its wrong ruling about same-sex marriage, it looked like the wicked had triumphed. But eventually they will be judged. And righteousness will prevail. So I've learned that God always has the last say. Now the righteous prevail and may not come quickly enough in our eyes, but, but guess what? It will happen. God answered Field chapter 2 where we have our text. Then Habakkuk concludes his book with a prayer of triumph. With his questions answered and a new understanding of God's power and love. Habakkuk rejoices in who God is and in what he will do. The prophet says in the third chapter, verses 18 and 19, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind feet. And he will make me to walk upon my high places. In other words, in the end, we win. See, if Habakkuk realized something just like you and I should also realize, and that is, in the end, we win. Now, Habakkuk had asked God two questions in chapter 1. First, he had asked God why did it seem like he was sitting by and watching wickedness going on and seemingly doing nothing. God answered Habakkuk and let him know that he was raising up the child then, that he would use them to correct Judah. Now this upset Habakkuk, and he asked God the second question, why would he use a more wicked people than Judah to correct them? Sometimes you can't satisfy nobody. And he, he, he couldn't understand why God would use such ruthless people. Now, our text scripture is part of God's answer to Habakkuk. God had given Habakkuk a vision of what he was going to do, but Habakkuk didn't like the vision. So when he questioned God's vision, God answers him. So, Pastor Robinson, you are God's visionary. For greater Emmanuel. Now, greater Emmanuel, Pastor, depends on you to not only seek God, but to hear the voice of God. Great Emmanuel sees you, their Pastor, as a visionary. So let's look at some reasons why, Pastor Robinson, you are called a visionary. Let me say this. There is a difference in ambition and vision. You see, ambition is what one desires to do or become in life. Vision is foresight with insight. You see, in our churches today, we have a lot of pastors, preachers, who have mistaken ambition for vision. The church has become all about what they want to do. They try 
try to make it a vision, but it's nothing but ambition. The vision is God speaking what's going to happen and then giving directions to get it done. That's called foresight with insight. So, so Pastor Robinson, you, you have foresight with insight. So, so let me share four things with you, Pastor. Uh, that greater Emmanuel and the community should see in you as God's visionary. And it's right in the scripture, Pastor, right. that we read today. First of all, first of all, uh, Pastor Robinson, you must separate yourself. You see, in verse 1 of chapter 2, Habakkuk said, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. You see, Habakkuk went up into the watchtower away from the people so he could hear God. Now watchtowers were built upon the city walls or ramparts so watchmen could see people where the enemies or messengers approaching their city while they were still at a distance. But you can't see things while you're at the same level as everybody else. While it might seem like the prophet Habakkuk was talking about a physical watchtower, it is more likely that he was talking about his attitude or the position of his heart. He knew that in order for him to hear God, he needed to change his attitude. He needed to change the position of his heart. You see, we can't hear God thinking like everybody else. We can't hear God talking like everybody else. We, we, we can't hear God doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. But we must from time to time separate ourselves if we want to hear from God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, said the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Paul here reminded these Corinthian Christians that they had to separate themselves from unbelief. Hear from God. We need to learn how to go into our secret closet and separate ourselves from time to time. You see, when God gave Moses the law, and the Ten Commandments, Moses had to separate himself and go upon Mount Sinai in order to receive what God had for his people. When God gave John the Apostle the prophecy for the New Testament church of things that were to come in the book of Revelation, John received the revelation when he was separated from everyone else on the Isle of Patmos. When Peter received the vision that God offers salvation to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Guess what? Yeah. Peter was up on the housetop, <laughs> separated from everyone else when God gave him that vision. We have to separate ourselves, pastors and preachers, if we want to hear from God. Yeah. Pastor Robinson. Don't be afraid or ashamed to be seen or known as one who's not afraid to separate himself so that you can not only hear God, but pass to hear from God. Amen. So you must separate yourself. Secondly, you must wait and expect to hear from God. In verse 1, the Bible says that I will watch to see what he would say unto me. Yeah. You see, Habakkuk expected God to answer him. Yeah. He asked God the question as to why he would use the Chaldeans, a people more wicked than Judah, yeah. to punish them. Yeah. To Habakkuk, this just didn't make sense. Yeah. So because Habakkuk knew that his relationship with God was where it needed to be, when he prayed, he expected to hear from God. So many of us as Christians, we pray. 
But we don't know if God will answer. You see, what brings about that doubt in us is that we know that we are not living as God has called us to live. We know that we are not doing nor have we done the things he's called us to do. Therefore, it plants a seed of doubt in our minds and hearts as to whether or not God will answer our prayer. But we must learn how to pray with expectancy. You see, Habakkuk anxiously awaited an answer from God. He didn't know what the answer would be, but he knew that God would answer him. You see, as children of the Most High God, there are some things we just ought to know about our God. You see, we also must wait patiently if we want to hear from God. I, I, I'm glad that God don't work on our time. Oh. Amen. You see, God works on his own timetable. Saints of old used to describe waiting on God this way. Uh, they said he may not come when you want him. But he's always on time. The Bible teaches us that when it comes to people, we need long suffering. But when it comes to God, we need patience. You see, one of our biggest problems in the church today is that we often get ahead of God. Amen. Noah waited 120 years and preached the same sermon Amen. before the rain showed up. Amen. Moses waited 40 years in the desert before God used him to deliver his people from bondage. David waited until Saul was dead before he could become king of Israel. He didn't kill Saul, but he waited and let God take care of Saul. Pastor Robinson, not only are you to be a man of God who knows how to separate himself, you also need to be a man of God who knows how to wait and expect to hear from God. Thirdly, you must receive the vision and then obey it. Now, let me say that again. You must receive the vision and then obey it. Amen. Remember, Pastor, who the vision is given to. You see, verse 2 says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Y'all can get that on your way home. And make it plain upon table that he may run that readeth thee. Yes, Here we see that God has not changed what he said in chapter 1. Yes. In chapter 1, he spoke the vision to Habakkuk. Yes. But here in our text scripture, he tells Habakkuk to write the vision yes. and make it plain. Yes. God wanted a permanent record of what he had told Habakkuk of the things that would happen. You see, when God spoke it, that was for a back of Satan. When he said, write the vision, it's for everybody else's sake who reads it. You see, we must understand that just because we don't like what God has said, it does not mean that God is going to change his mind. Just because we ignore it does not mean that it's not going to happen. Today we have God's vision in writing, which is called the Holy Bible. And it tells us everything that God has spoken that will come to pass. The thing that we don't understand is just because we don't believe the Bible, just because we don't follow its instructions, just because we don't live by its principles, just because we don't agree with it does not change the fact that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. You see, the problem is that we have some pastor preachers who water down the word of God. 
Some skip over those things that they know people don't like to hear. They preach sermons that make people feel good, but never get around to talking about sin. And then there are those who feel like the Bible is outdated. Then tell me why, when I read this so-called outdated book, when I find myself in a situation with no hope, I find hope in this book. When I don't know which way to turn, I, I find direction in this book. When I'm dealing with the storm of life, I can pick up this so-called outdated book and I can find peace in the midst of my life. down to my last time. And I pick up this so-called outdated book. And I read the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Then all of a sudden all of my worries just seem to disappear. When I'm sick and it looks like there's no hope. I pick up this so-called outdated book and I read nothing is impossible with God. The vision that's written in this book tells me that I can't go by what it looks like. Because when I read the end of the vision in this book called the Bible, it tells me that in the end, we win. Every now and then. When it seems like all hope is gone, we need to flip over to the end of the book and be reminded that in the end, we win. You're God's chosen visionary because you separate yourself. Because you wait and expect to hear from God. And because you receive the vision and obey it. Yes. Lastly, I want to talk about because you trust God to bring the vision to pass. Verse 3 says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Now just because Habakkuk questioned God, God didn't change the vision. God said the vision is the vision. And it's for an appointed time and it will come to pass. See, the problem we have today with church folk is that when God gives his pastor a vision, church folk act like God is asking them for their approval. is what he's already put in place. So therefore he does not need our approval. See, he allows us to see it not so we can approve it but it's for our information so that we can respond accordingly. Well, when God sets forth this vision I need to tell somebody it will come to pass. And we need to know that God will move you. Go over you. Go around you. Go through you. He will do whatever is necessary to fulfill his vision. Man can't stop God's vision. He tells Habakkuk, although it might take a while for it to come to pass, he said, don't worry, 
it will surely come to pass. You see, God has his reasons for allowing time to pass before he brings a vision to pass. Sometimes it's space for us to repent. Sometimes he's preparing us for the vision. But, but whatever the reason is, God in his own time will bring it to pass. Pastor Robinson, you are a visionary because you separate yourself. Because you wait and expect to hear from God. Because you receive the vision and obey it. And because you trust God to bring the vision to pay. Before I take my seat, I must talk about another vision that was given. It's a vision that the prophets of old had of the coming Messiah. Isaiah, the prophet saw him as a rug out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch that shall grow out of his root. He also saw him as a suffering servant. Isaiah said he is despised and rejected of me. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our grief and carried our sorrow. Yet did we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. I like this part, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. Finally got rid of this trouble, man. 
when they forgot what he said. That on the third day, I will rise. He said that all night cry. Say that all day sound.
now in the hand of Pastor John. Ears, 
and they would accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passion. And would turn away from listening to the truth. And wander off into some myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. The Bible calls the pastoral office a noble thing. Given all else it says about pastoring, we also know it to be a weighty thing. They set up something they call a honeymoon. Everybody praise you and on your side. Sometimes church folk can be strange. <laughs> you will be judged more strictly by the Lord, perhaps, but also by your church. They look to you to be an example for them. They look for you to cast the vision. First, I charge you before God to preach the word. Church needs your wisdom. They need your experience. They need your knowledge. You will not get to the end of your ministry and think that I wish I preached the Bible less. Whatever you do, preach the word of God. Secondly, we charge you before God to lead them strongly and patiently. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but power and of love and of a sound mind. Times get hard, just stir it up. Stoke it to flame, just fan it to flame, just keep on preaching the word of God. Thirdly, we charge you to be sober-minded about your life and your ministry. You must be sober-minded about life and its trouble. It gets difficult sometimes. And oftentimes, in the midst of you ministering to others, we know that there are times when you need to be ministered to. Oftentimes, when you're praying for everybody else, don't forget that you need prayers too. And I'd like to thank that the Galilee Griggs Association, all his pastors and members, and a lot of them are here today. We're standing behind you and we're praying for you and greater Emmanuel. Amen. We charge you before God to commit to these things the faithful ministry of the word and prayer so that your ministry might be fulfilled by the grace of God. And then, fourthly, then I'm finished. We charge you to resolve to knowing nothing among your people but Christ and him crucified. That is Paul's phrase in 1 Corinthians 2 and 2. Here he says in verse 5, do the work of an evangelist. That is a proclaimer of the gospel and to fulfill your ministry. Yes, we're living in dangerous times. But especially in this crazy season of drifting from centrality of the gospel, of giving in to our fears and all of our anxieties, and our charge is to not chase dreams or scratch ears, but to fulfill your ministry. Do not pursue your own greatness magnify Christ through the ministry of the good news. And when you get to the end, you'll hear him say, not reverend, not doctor, not elder, not bishop, but well done. Thou good and thou faithful self. You've been faithful with the good of the few things. Coming up with higher. I'll make you ruler over many. God bless you.
We give God praise today and let's give God a hand of praise for this word that we brought our preacher today. Pastor Madison, I thought he was going to leave that sermon up here and then you were going to share it and not let him take it back to the continent so we could preach it down on this end. What a word. I'd like for Great Emmanuel to stand. We have heard God through the preacher today exalting the preacher and I'm here to exalt you as the members. Your job is Exodus 17 through 11 when Moses' hands grew weary. The people held his arms up and as the pew Pastor's hand is going to get weary. Arms will get weary. And it's your job to hold them up. Hold them up with prayer. If you P R A Y for him, you won't P R E Y on him. So hold him up with prayer. And Judges, there was a battle, Judges 7 21. God gave Israel the victory because the book said everyone stood in his own place. If you want victory, you got to stay in your place. God did not charge you to be the pastor. He charged you to do what you're supposed to do. And then coincide with our preacher in Exodus 6 and 1 it says and the Lord spake unto Moses. Exodus 7 and 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses. Exodus 8 and 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses. Exodus 9, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses. Exodus 9, and not Exodus 10 and 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses. Exodus 11 and 1, it said, And the Lord speak unto Moses. Exodus 12 and 1, it said, And the Lord speak unto Moses. Exodus 14, it said, And the Lord speak unto Moses. Show me in here where the Lord ever spoke to a committee. God called a man, Father the man. Thank you. 
included in the number of the saints. We present to you the pastor that God has called. Not have you chosen, but God who has sent you the pastor. I present to you now the Reverend R. John Robinson.
evening. My name is Deborah Terry, and I'm the president of the women's ministry. And to our pastor and our first lady, we'd like to present you a love gift. Thank you. 
song that goes, I looked around and I couldn't see nobody. And I looked around and I couldn't see nobody. <laughs> but I just want to say to Missionary Baptist Convention Incorporated. Congratulations, Pastor Arjan Robinson. Welcome to Texas State Missionary Baptist Convention. I'm Dr. Bruce D. Dash, President of Texas State. Take this opportunity to congratulate and welcome you, the elected senior pastor of the Greater Emmanuel Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. We have and we hope that as you envision the future exceptionally, you will be blessed in your ministry and great remain. As you serve God's call in your life, we pray for a glorious reign and spiritual guidance as you lead God's people. Together we are striving to become the kind of convention described in the Bible, where there is relevant training, heartfelt worship, honest friendship, constant prayer, and compassion. As the Greater Emmanuel Baptist Church family gives leadership to the commemoration of this wonderful occasion, Reverend R. John Robinson, your installation services, June the 11th, 2023. I pray that the glory of God's presence will manifest in the morning service with Dr. Johnny Bradley, as well as your investigative service. 3 p.m. with Dr. Reverend Gregory Trotter and the Friendship Baptist Church family of the college. I look forward to working with you and any assistance I can offer. I am here for you. President Bruce D. Thatcher, who is in Washington, D.C., he meets before the Senate on tomorrow. stated that you all couldn't hear, but I'm going to get a mic. I know it works. <laughs> because we have been blessed uh, down through the years, which we know, those of you know Pastor Hudson in the past, we were truly blessed. And we have truly missed Pastor Hudson. But God, as Pastor Hudson would always say, always has a bull opinion. <laughs> and he has one that he can go to when he gets ready for him. And God has blessed us with one in the person of Reverend R. John Roberts. Amen. Stand up, Luke. Stand up right quick. Amen. Now, all, some of you may know, and maybe some of you young, younger people, don't even look like 50. Get to you. <laughs> but I'm going to present it to you. It's 
since you all won, you take care of the rest of it. <laughs> we love you, man. God bless you. Come on. Bring it back to church now.
deacons and trustees, our music ministry, and just to all of you all who are here. I'd like to thank Pastor Trotter and Sister Trotter. They had to depart and leave. And I'd like to thank the Friendship Baptist Church family of the colony. Thank God for them. Every time me and my family we go there, Pastor Jenkins always say that we like to welcome Reverend Robinson because this is his home, second home away from home. And I thank God for Friendship Baptist Church of the Colony because they really do treat us like family. And I'd like to thank my great Emmanuel Baptist Church family. Let's give them a round of applause. I love them. To all my preacher friends, all the preachers, would you all stand up, please? All my friends who are in the ministry, the gospel of Jesus Christ, would you all please stand? Thank God for you. I see a couple of my co workers out there. Would y'all please stand? I see Mr. Walker, Sean Lee, and Brother Raymond Thomas. Those are my co workers with me. And I like to ask my family, all of my family to understand, me and my wife family members, would y'all stand, please? Thank God. My son Ty, my daughter can be here on today. She's working, but my son Ty is here. Wave your hand at the top so everybody can see you. God bless you. Thank you. You know, uh, my, my life really changed back in 2019 when my mother was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. And I tell this story because this story really changed me in my life me and my wife's life. We've been Christians, but we really saw the hand of God doing this transition. My mother was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer in 2019 on Valentine's Day. Me and my wife had already made plans to go out and celebrate with one another, but we wind up spending Valentine's Day with my mother. Then in December of 2019, my mentor, Reverend Naaman Wesley, my uncle, he got hit by a car. He had dementia. Broke his hip, but I had to put him in a nursing home. His baby brother, Charles Wesley, he has underlying conditions as well. So not only did I have to take care of my mother, I had to take care of my uncle Naaman Wesley and my uncle Charles Wesley. One Tuesday night, I was crying and I got on 20. I just rolled down the windows and I said, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So I'm taking care of my mother, my two uncles. My wife's not working. The whole thing was on my shoulders. And as I wrote, I found myself on Oak Cliff, and then I looked up, I was in Fort Worth, Texas. I turned around and I came back toward Dallas, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you were made for this. I had to look back since. But one thing that I discovered while my mother was getting ready to transition from earth to heaven, while my uncle Reverend Wesley was getting ready to transition from earth to heaven, both of them told me that I would pastor the Great Emmanuel Baptist Church. I didn't believe them at that time because I was concerned about getting them well. But Pastor Hudson, I can't stand up here without saying nothing about Pastor Hudson. That's my father in the ministry. But not only was he my father in the ministry, but he shared a lot of personal things with me the last six years of his life. Pastor Hudson showed me how to preach and teach the word the right way. Reverend Wesley showed me how to live the right way outside of the church. He led by example. But one particular Sunday morning, Pastor Hudson said, Reverend Arjuna, I had a dream last night. He said, I was in a church and the congregation was full. He said, but I couldn't put the, I couldn't put the dream together, son. I said, Pastor Papa Hudson, I had the same dream. But this time I was standing in the pool pit. There was a full crowd and you was in the audience smiling. Right now I'm in the pool pit. There's a full crowd in the congregation.
Amen. 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 